Tim, thanks very much indeed. Uh, when Tim spoke to me earlier in the year and, and said, would I like to do the Peter Naylor Memorial Lecture, I was saying yes almost before he finished the sentence because um, Peter was a, a great source of wisdom for me. I, I first met him in 1979 when I arrived at the Naval Staff College at Greenwich uh, as a young lieutenant. Um, and I was considering my future because I, in those days we were all non-graduates, or most of us were. Um, and uh, I was very interested in the law that governs the conduct of naval operations. And I decided that really I need to find out a, a lot more about it than I knew. And I decided that I was probably going to go, have to go off to university to read something approaching law to get a reasonable understanding of the subject. And Peter was a great source of advice in that process. Two years after that, I went off and spent five years in the reserve while I studied as an undergraduate and then as a postgraduate at the University of Aberdeen before going back into the Navy. And would you believe the first job that I got was back in Greenwich. And so not only did he help me get out of the Navy into academe, but he helped me back into the Navy from academe. And I, I have a great deal of respect for him and his memory. Uh, he was a very genuinely good friend in that process. The other prob a problem I've got is that, of course, having said that I'd do it, I then realized that I had a, a terrible job because uh, Peter was a brilliant speaker. Um, and I, I remember in 1979 sitting transfixed in the lecture theater at Greenwich as, as Peter delivered a, a really rather fascinating lecture, which consisted of about four or five completely different themes. And I sat there wondering, what on earth have these themes got to do with each other? And then in the last five minutes, he wrapped them all together in a wonderful sort of way, in a very stylish and urbane manner. Uh, and, and it was a fascinating and excellent lecture. He was, uh, he was a great man, and it's a great honor for me to be giving the Peter Naylor Memorial Lecture. And it's also a great honor and a delight to be giving it in, 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 this, in this establishment. I didn't know that Peter was a Mercer, and that he'd been educated at Mercer School. I do know that now, and it's a very, very appropriate place to have this event, and I'm very grateful to everybody who's, who's put it together. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. I'm very, very happy to be here and very happy to be speaking about this subject. Now, I was asked by Tim to, to talk about piracy, but what I want to talk about, and I'm not saying that I'm not going to talk about piracy, I'm saying that as I looked at the whole subject of crime at sea and the way that we deal with it, it occurred to me that there was a great deal going on, and it was important to step back from some of the detail and to look uh, in a strategic sense at a long-term uh, view of what is going on at sea, to look down, uh, look, look, at, look, look at the strategic level and look at almost a theoretical level to try and put what's going on into some sort of context and to give it some sort of understanding. I know there's been an enormous amount in the press, uh, on the television, in the newspapers, and academically said about piracy, particularly that in Somalia and in the Indian Ocean. And I, what I want to do is I want to raise some ideas in your minds about how, what the context is for what's going on and how the difficulties associated with dealing with it are probably the cause, are probably caused by something that is going on in the general governance of the oceans, which I believe is profoundly important. That's what I, that's what I want to try and do this evening. Now, just a couple of, of incidents that I, I literally picked these up off the web a couple of days ago when I was preparing finally for this, this evening. Um, and, and just a couple of things, the sorts of things that are going on out there on a, almost on a daily or weekly basis. Just four or five weeks ago, a Sierra Leone registered merchant ship, 19 miles off the Indian coast, a ship called the Seaman Guard Ohio, owned by a US-based private military security company, 
was stopped and detained by the Indian authorities. It had 35 weapons on board, 6,000 rounds of ammunition, and it was accused by the Indian authorities of illegally entering Indian territory and carrying unauthorized weapons. As I said, it was 19 miles off the Indian coast. Um, what was it doing there? How was it, what was its status at the time? Um, did it have a authority from the Sierra Leone government to carry the weapons that it was carrying? Those sorts of vessels, though, in the Indian Ocean at the moment are not uncommon. Um, they are registered in some pretty odd places. Sierra Leone is not renowned as a major maritime power, but it is a very convenient place to register a ship, as indeed is Zanzibar. And let's come to the case of Zanzibar. Not even a, a full state, because, of course, it's linked um, in, within the, uh, the state of Tanzania. There's been some con controversy of late about the number of Iranian vessels that are flagged under Zanzibar flag. And the question is, are they flagged under a Zanzibar flag in order to try and bust some sort of UN sanction regime? But there was a very interesting one uh, stopped by Italian authorities in the Mediterranean, just off the coast of Sicily, um, three or four weeks ago. It was carrying 30 tons of hashish, cannabis. And the Italians um, boarded it, and they've detained it, and, and so on and so forth. And I look at these incidents, and I think to myself as a lawyer, exactly what were the circumstances? What position was that ship in when it was stopped? Because there is something that we have to grapple with at sea, um, and we've had to grapple with this at sea for a long time, called exclusive flag state jurisdiction. What authority did the Italians have to board and search that vessel in the Mediterranean? As I said, it was a Zanzibar-registered vessel. Um, it was owned by a company registered in the Marshall Islands. The international shipping business is a complex business. It's an international business, very much so. It's got international tentacles all over. So these incidents are not unusual. They're the sort of things that if you go into the, into the shipping press, you will find incidents like this all the time. Uh, it took me about two minutes to find them. I didn't have to do serious research to find those two or three situations that I've just related. There is something wrong, I think, with the maintenance of good government, governance at sea. It's problematic. And what I want to do is ask why that is the case and what we might do to solve that particular problem. Now, I need to take us out of the weeds, I think. I mean, it would be great to talk about how warships deal with particular incidents of piracy. But I want to take us out of the weeds, as I said a, uh, just a few minutes ago. I want to talk about not the, not the detail, the concentrate on the detail of law enforcement operations at sea. I want to talk about the strategic background to that, the theoretical background, the legal background, the political, the economic background to it, um, in order to gain some perspective. But before I get on to that, I, I just want you to pick up the map that I've asked Gresham College to put out on the chairs. A little bit of geography, because I think it's very useful. I don't know how many of you have experience of the sea, or to what extent you have experience of the sea. But whenever I'm giving a lecture of this sort, I like to show a map like this to give some, some perspective. That's a, a map of the, of, of the world. It shows both the landmass and the oceans. It shows also around the continents and around the islands a line which is essentially the 200-mile limit of exclusive economic zones um, along the coasts of all the coastal states within the world. The total surface area of the globe is about 510 million square kilometers. The total covered by salt water is about 370 million square kilometers. And the high seas, which is what I'm going to be thinking about this evening, actually don't stretch really from the 200 mile limit, they stretch from the 12 mile limit. 
So forget the 200 mile limit, let's go right back close inshore. And from 12 miles out, you have, in terms of free movement of shipping, you have what we regard as the area of sea to which freedom is associated. So basically we're talking about something like 300 million square kilometers of ocean. And the important thing about that figure is that whereas we tend to think of all land territory as divided between states, and jurisdiction is quite straightforward, we cross a land boundary, we move from one state into another, there is no ownership of that, of that sea area from the 12-mile limit out. There are other forms of jurisdiction beyond 12 miles, but the, the waters of the oceans of the world, that 300 million square kilometers of the planet, do not fall within the jurisdiction of states. And we, we do tend at times to forget this. Let me ask a question, because the question that I, I, I arrived at, which is going to provide me with the sort of framework of what I'm going to say this evening, is I'm going to ask the question, are we witnessing the end of what I call the Groshen era at sea? And I need to explain the question before I try and answer it. Let's take our minds back to the 17th century very briefly. It's a very, very important period in the development of the international system. We had a 30 years war followed by the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, which created the conditions for the development of what we now know as the modern state system and international relations specialists and historians often refer to the state system as the Westphalian state system, and that's the reason why it's called that. Well, of course, the Westphalian state system is only really focused on the land mass. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with the sovereignty of the oceans. Two or three years before the uh, Peace of Westphalia, a Dutch lawyer by the name of Hugo de Groot, the Latinized version of his name being Grotius, he died. Grotius was an extremely important thinker and a founder member of the, of the bar of international law, if you like. He is, is often referred to as the father of international law. Um, he had written... In 1625, he published a book called De Jure Baliac Parchis, which is seen very largely as essentially the first international law text. But in the context of what I'm saying this evening, the more important publication of his dates from 1609, and it's called Mare Liberum, and it's essentially about the freedom of the seas. Grotius, as a lawyer, was defending Dutch commercial interests. And the Dutch favoured free trade while the English did not. The English Navigation Acts came into conflict with Dutch policy and resulted in the First Anglo-Dutch War. Nevertheless, the notion of freedom at sea was one that survived that dispute. And indeed, Britain became the great champion of the freedom of the seas. What does the freedom of the seas mean? Well, essentially, anything beyond the territorial limit, which in those days was simply a three-mile limit out of the coast, and you can see three miles very easily from the beach, everything beyond that was beyond the jurisdiction of states. It was free for anybody to use in any way they wished. And that three-mile limit of territorial sea survived until the middle of the 20th century. And it was defended, the notion of free seas was defended by the major maritime powers. And it was very easy to maintain for very, very simple reason. First of all, the major maritime powers controlled the environment to the extent that free trade was possible. They would defend the freedom of trade, particularly their own trade. But the other reason was because economically, what we now see as a very important resource in the ocean, 
was not a factor to be vectored into consideration. Ocean resources, um, in order to be of value, need to have scarcity. But in the 17th century, and right the way through to the middle of the 20th century, ocean resources, frankly, were not scarce. What do I mean about this? Well, there are two sorts of ocean resources. It's very simply, fish and minerals. Fish stocks in the oceans of the world, generally speaking, were not scarce until after the Second World War. The reason they became scarce after the Second World War was down to technology. And, of course, the resources, the mineral resources of the seas, the seabeds and the ground below the seabed, the continental shelf, they weren't even known about, largely. And they certainly weren't recoverable because the technology wasn't there to recover them. So the issue of ocean resources was simply not a factor to even think about when thinking about the governance of the oceans. It wasn't a factor at all. The only thing to concern ourselves with from the middle of the 16th, 17th century right the way through to the middle of the 20th century was the freedom to navigate, the freedom to move, the freedom to use the oceans as a vehicle, as, as, as a means of transportation, as a medium for transportation. And there were three norms, really, that supported that. One was the outlawing of piracy. The second was the notion of um, neut neutral flag during wartime. And the, third, and the third norm, if you like, was the establishment of exclusive flag state jurisdiction. I'll say a little bit about each of those. First of all, piracy. The reason piracy was turned into an international crime and made a universal crime, the first and only international crime, again until the late 20th century, was because it threatened the freedom of movement on the high seas. That was the reason that piracy was outlawed. And it was outlawed, and, provide, and states were provided with universal jurisdiction to it. So if you found a pirate, you could prosecute and hang that pirate from the yard arm if you wished, having convicted him of that particular crime. Universal jurisdiction was there. Universal jurisdiction was utilized and it was used to combat piracy. And indeed, that same principle has been in evidence in the context of piracy in the Indian Ocean uh, even up to the present day. The issue of neutrality in war, this was another... The, the, the oceans were free to use, so they were also a free battleground. If states were warring with each other, they had the, uh, the high seas to fight their naval battles on, and they were not breaching the sovereignty of any other, any other states. So the, the notion of neutral flag and goods carried in neutral flag that had belligerent nature, the whole issue of board and search, belligerent visit and search, and the notion of prize courts during war this was all to do with managing the freedom of the seas, which included the freedom of warring states to fight their war, but at the same time allowing neutral states to continue their trading activities. And then finally, fundamentally, exclusive flag state jurisdiction, which was to do with the only state that could legitimately interfere with a merchant ship on the high seas was the state in which that merchant ship was flagged. So going back to the case of the Sierra Leone registered vessel in the Mediterranean, in theory at least, even today, exclusive flag state jurisdiction on the high seas, if that vessel was on the high seas when it was intercepted by the Italian authorities, and I'm not exactly sure where it was in, in strict terms in that sense, but if it was passaging across the Mediterranean beyond the 12-mile limit. It was on the high seas, and therefore the only state that could exercise jurisdiction over it was Sierra Leone. It could have been carrying 30 tonnes of cannabis, if it were, as it indeed was, but that was only Sierra Leone's business, strictly speaking, if you accept the notion of exclusive flag state jurisdiction. And I'll come back to this issue 
again a little bit later on. All of this has changed, is my belief, in the last 50, 60, 70 years. The post-Second World War period is a vital period in the development of ocean governance, in my view. And let me explain why I think that is the case. The first thing we have to thought, think about is, is the politics of the oceans. We also have to think about technology and the oceans. I'll say a very little bit about both of those two things. First of all, the politics of the ocean. In 1945, when the United Nations was founded, there were less than 50 members. Today, there are almost 200. There, have, there has been a fourfold increase in the number of, a number of states within the international system. Now, in the late 1940s and early 1950s, it was the major powers that could dominate what went on in the United Nations. The decolonization process in the 1950s and 1960s trebled the number of independent sovereign states within the system, and those states that were new to the system tended to dominate the general business within the United Nations, including the development of the law of the sea. So what has happened in the last 50, 60, 70 years is that the massive increase in the number of states, many of which are not maritime powers at all, has had a major impact on the development of governance in relation to the oceans. Let me talk about technology. I said that in the period of high seas freedom in the traditional sense, ocean resources simply didn't exist in any economic sense. If you wanted to go fishing in the middle of the 19th century, you just went off and fished. You weren't going to fish out the fish stocks. That's not the case today. I'll give you a very good example of this. If you want to catch pelagic fish, which are the fish that swim in large shoals in mid-water, they're mid-water feeding fish, they don't feed off the bottom, they, they gather in shoals and they exist in shoals, then you would probably these days use something called a purse saner to do that. A modern purse sane vessel has a net that is roughly the size of the upturned dome of St. Paul's Cathedral. It is equipped with high-definition sonar, and it steams around the North Sea or the North Atlantic or indeed anywhere else in the world looking for shoals of fish like herring and mackerel. And when it finds them, it feeds that net around the shoal, catches the entire shoal, and then sticks a large vacuum cleaner into the caught shoal and sucks that shoal into its holes. A single, a single catch by a first purse sane fishing vessel today will catch more fish than the entire British herring drifter fleet before the Second World War, caught in a day on the fishing grounds. So if you want to know why there's a shortage of fish these days, it's down almost entirely to technology. Don't forget either the bottom feeding fish, the trawlers, the bottom trawls, which need to be dragged along the seabed. Of course, a hundred years ago, as a deckhand on a fishing boat, you had to haul the nets on board when you'd filled them with fish. Well, of course, these days, we've got powered hauling systems. We've got very powerful ships that tow these nets long distances. They are enormous nets. And again, the demersal, the bottom-feeding fish, are caught using those sorts of technologies. So these technologies have rendered fish scarce. And they need to be regulated, and it's my contention, and I can talk about this later uh, in questions particularly, it's my, um, it's my um, uh, belief that the regulation of fishing over the last half century has been sadly inadequate, and our fish stocks are being fished out. But that's a whole, whole other question. Let me talk about mineral deposits as well, because the first real exploitation of the continental shelf occurred... Um, in the Gulf of Mexico in the 1940s, when the Americans started to drill for oil and gas in the Gulf of Mexico. 
And President Truman issued something called the Truman Proclamation, which was the first step in the process of developing continental shelf jurisdiction. As soon as you rendered the resources in the continental shelf recoverable, of course, people wanted to own them. Before it was technically possible to recover them, nobody cared, it, cared less about who owned them because it didn't really matter. As soon as the technology became available, then they developed economic value, scarcity, and they needed some measure of regulation. There are a couple of other things that have profoundly impacted on the global environment. Globalization. Now, speaking in the city of London, if I were talking to most of those who are involved in the activities of the city of London, I know that shipping is a big part of it, but the financiers would assume that I was about to set off on a conversation about finance. Globalization, of course, requires international financial processes to make it work. But globalization in the flesh is global trade. Global trade is what makes globalization what it is today. That is what we're talking about. I, the shirt I am wearing today, this evening, which I bought from the German street shirt maker, which is a bit of a joke these days, but the, the German street shop where I've been buying my shirt since the early 1970s, has, I can guarantee you, spent days, if not weeks, in a container. It's on my back because it was made in China and shipped across the Indian Ocean until I was able to buy it along the road in German Street. When I joined the, the Royal Navy in 1971, global trade stood in the region of 2,600 million tons a year. Global trade today is 8,500 million tons. It's almost quadrupled. That is globalization. Global trade has almost quadrupled in the four decades since I joined the Royal Navy in 1971. There are 55,000 cargo-carrying ships at sea today, and about 10% of them are container ships. Now, container ships didn't even exist in 1945. They are entirely a post-war phenomenon. There are about 13 million containers being carried in those ships, and a very large proportion of those 13 million are at sea as I speak. The container ships I'm talking about are remarkable vessels now. Maersk, the shipping company, have, are currently taking delivery of a new class of 10 container ships that carry 18,000 containers. And I can tell you that there are designs already in train to produce a 25,000 container capacity container ship. Now, just imagine what I'm talking about here. You, you know what a container looks like because you get stuck behind them on the roads of this country almost every day. Imagine 18,000 articulated lorries in one ship steaming across the Indian Ocean. The container business is, is, is a big business. This is something that is going on at sea which simply wasn't in evidence back in the 1940s. This is brand new. The circumstances are brand new. So what do we have in the way of governance structures? And I'll come back to the problems with all of this in a second. Well, we, we have uh, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which was negotiated in the early 1970s through to the early 1980s. And that is the basic framework document for the law of the sea these days. And it's essentially a fairly stable regime in many ways. There isn't a great deal of um, pressure on anyone to change it. Partly because, of course, it took about 10 years to negotiate. And it would be very, very difficult indeed to renegotiate something that was extremely complex at the time it was negotiated 30, 40 years ago. The ocean regime is basically stable, but I would say arguably that it needs change. 
and it needs change for a number of reasons. With all that activity going on at sea, a great deal more activity than was going on 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago, there is a need for regulation. There's not only a need for regulation because we've got to think now about ocean resources. There's a need for regulation because there are vulnerabilities out there. Can you imagine what it would be like if somebody set out deliberately to disrupt mask shipping's container activity? either by attacking its ships at sea or by attacking the major container hubs around the globe. You can't put an 18,000 capacity container ship into any old port. It has to go into a major container terminal. These are potential vulnerabilities. If you attacked that with determination and skill, you could completely disrupt international trade and send globalization into reverse. And I think sometimes these days people think that globalization is a given, it's, a, it's, it's, it's happening, okay, we have peaks and troughs and we have odd re re recessions here and there and trade dri drops off a bit. Globalization, the first, stage, the first evidence of globalization was the late 19th century. It was brought to a halt in 1914 by the... First World War. And actually, the globalization that we've been experiencing the last 10, 20, 30 years has been no more profound in its consequences than the globalization that existed in the late 19th century, early 20th century. So don't think that globalization is always going to be with us. If we are not careful, it can be disrupted, it can be stopped in its tracks. And if I was trying to think of a way of doing that these days, I'd be looking very seriously at trying to disrupt container traffic around the world. The suppression of crime at sea is, to my mind, extremely important. It's not just piracy. This is why when Tim asked me to talk about piracy, I was certainly going to mention it, but it's, there's a lot more potential criminal activity that is going on out in the high seas that needs to be coped with. We've got unlawful, unregulated, and unreported fishing. I've already said that fish stocks are threatened by technology. They're also threatened by illegal, illicit fishing activities globally. And unless you've got the policing facilities, the capacity to, to, to police your fishing grounds, in your 200-mile exclusive economic zone, you have no way of preventing that happening. So piracy, unlawful, unregulated, and unreported fishing, the illicit trade in people, drugs, arms. There's a, there's a, there's a wonderful trade in illegal oil off Nigeria at the moment. People are producing and refining oil illegally ashore in Nigeria and then getting rid of it in ships illegally out of Nigeria. There is, a, there is an illicit oil business in West Africa. The sinking of ships to claim insurance or the rebadging and re-identifying of renaming of ships in convenient ports in order to commit maritime fraud. All of these things are going on out there. Maritime security is very important. And the process of disrupting maritime trade, we've not seen anything yet, is my feeling. I'm not going to be massively, um, you know, I'm not going to overstress this. I don't know what the future will hold. I'm not somebody, generally speaking, who believes in prediction. But I do think it's necessary to warn there is criminal activity going on on the high seas. We need to be aware of the potential that that criminal activity has to completely disrupt our lives. I like buying my shirts in German Street, and I like what I buy there. And I don't want to have to go there one day and say, uh, and find out that I can't buy the shirts that I want because there is no global trade using container ships at the moment because they've all been disrupted by some 
organization that has an interest in doing precisely that. The problem that we've got, and the one that I've identified, which is the flaw that we have to deal with, is that issue of flag, exclusive flag state jurisdiction. It is no longer, in my view, working. It was fine in those days when merchant ships or the majority of merchant ships were flagged to flag states that also had a, a war fleet that was capable of protecting it and looking after its interests. But when you have flag states with very, very large merchant ship, merchant ship fleets, and those flag states are completely incapable of providing any security to those ships at all, or indeed exercising jurisdiction over them when they're on the high seas, then you have a problem. Let me tell you what the top 10 fleets in the world today are. They are, in order from the, the biggest to the 10th the, the largest. Panama, Liberia, the Marshall Islands, Hong Kong, the Bahamas, Singapore, Greece, Malta, China, and Cyprus. The only one of those that is even close to being regarded as a major maritime power is China. The other nine simply have not got the wherewithal whatsoever to go out there onto the high seas and either police their merchant fleet or protect it. So exclusive flag state jurisdiction in most cases is completely and utterly meaningless in any sense of, re of the regulatory sense. And if we look at the, the Zanzibar example I spoke about right at the beginning, one of the questions I've got there is, actually, what that ship was doing in the Mediterranean, carrying drugs, it may not have been acting illegally. I don't know whether hashish is illegal in the Zanzibar criminal code. Because if it isn't, then its presence on board that ship was not illegal. Do you see what I'm getting at? Exclusive flag state jurisdiction means that the law that applies on the merchant ship flagged to a state like Zanzibar, the criminal law that applies on board that ship is the criminal law of that flag state. That's a part of the big problem that it seems to me that we've got. So let me go back to the question I asked, is the Groshen era over? Well, to a certain extent, I think it already has disappeared. By the Groshen era, let me remind you, I'm talking about the, the notion of high seas freedom. This is the freedom to go anywhere, do anything, and to do that in the sure and certain knowledge that nobody but your own state can interfere with what you're doing. That is simply no longer the case. There's a great deal of regulation out there because, of course, one of the principles of high seas freedom in that traditional sense was the minimum of regulation. Any regulation was, was suspicious. So we want as little regulation as we can possibly have. Piracy, yes, we, we can regulate that. Yes, we can have a regulation about neutral shipping in time of war. But in any other sense, we want as little regulation as possible. Otherwise, we are challenging the freedom of the high seas. Well, today, I can tell you I've lost track. I don't know how many international treaties and conventions there are. And this is my subject. I couldn't tell you how many treaties there are at the moment that come under the general heading of the law of the sea. There are hundreds of them. So we are a massively regulated ocean. The trouble is, of course, that there is no government to enforce a lot of that. So the, the treaties are there, the conventions are there, the regulations exist, but the enforcement of those regulations is, I have to say, uh, seriously inadequate. There have been attempts to circumnavigate the notion of um, exclusive flag state jurisdiction. There are conventions, for example, that have been negotiated and are reasonably widely uh, signed up to by important states uh, that are trying to suppress the illicit narcotics trade and also trying to prevent and suppress unlawful activities against merchant shipping, the Sewer Convention. 
both of them, incidentally, or um, the, uh, the SUR Convention negotiated in the um, uh, Maritime Safety Committee of the International Maritime Organization just along the, the Thames um, across the, the river from, from Westminster. There is, a, there is a large amount of regulation there. What those conventions try to do is circumnavigate the inconvenience of exclusive flag state jurisdiction. We're trying to generate blanket consent by flag states to allow for foreign flag warships to board the ships of their state as part of the, of the package deal. But it's chipping away at the margins of it, it seems to me. We've left traditional high seas freedom behind, and it's been severely diluted since the middle of the 20th century, not least, of course, by the extent to which coastal states have declared jurisdictional zones out to the 12-mile territorial sea, the 200-mile exclusive economic zone, uh, which of course covers things like mineral resource exploitation and fisheries, uh, fisheries management, and also the continental shelf, which in certain cases can extend 350 miles or even more from the coast, depending on the geological features. Uh, that has, of course, severely dented the extent of pure, simple, straightforward high seas freedom. So I think the Groshen era is coming to an end. But I think there is a major problem with that that I've already mentioned, exclusive flag state jurisdiction. I mean, I would have been, a little while ago, I would have said, well, it's vital, you know, it's very important uh, that we maintain exclusive flag state jurisdiction on the high seas, because I'm looking at it from a British perspective. And it's very easy for me to say that, but then I come account across and I encounter the sorts of problems that we've had in the Indian Ocean and elsewhere in dealing with other illicit activity at sea, because the only merchant vessels that any warship can demand to board on the high seas that are not their own are those that are involved in piracy. And I want to make the point that piracy is not the only deal in town. There's a lot else going on besides. People smuggling. Just imagine that. People use the oceans to move themselves from one place where they don't want to be any longer, either because their security is threatened by conflict or because they simply want to come to London because it's paved with gold and they're going to be a lot better off. There are large numbers of people now trying to get across the ocean in boats to move from one place to another illegally, if you like. They're not actually they committing an offence? Probably not. But they are problematic, and I have to say that the international law dealing with that sort of problem is hopelessly inadequate. It is hopelessly inadequate. I, as a naval officer, would have, the last thing I would have wanted to have to deal with if I had been commanding a ship at sea on the high seas was a refugee boat full of people, two, three hundred bodies, that was in bad state of repair, was probably going to sink, and I needed to do something. What do you do with that? What do you do in that set of circumstances? Well, the humanitarian in you, of course, says, well, you must take them on board. And, of course, that is, in a sense, what they want. It's, it's a massive, practical, legal problem, and it hasn't yet been really seriously addressed. I think the... And I, I, I don't like prediction. I'm not, a, I'm not a great believer in predicting the future. I like to see what's gone on in the past, so I tend to study a lot of history. But I do that to try and improve my understanding of the present. And I look at what goes on today, and I hope that I better understand how to deal with problems as they come up in the future. I don't believe it's sensible to try and predict what will happen in 20, 30, 40, 50 years' time. I don't know what is going to happen in the fullness of time. I would imagine that the United Nations, whatever we might think about it, and I'm personally, I'm a great fan of the United Nations, but I know that there are also severe critics of it. I think the United Nations is vital 
as an institution, not only the, the big bit that everybody knows about the Security Council, but also the IMO along the road in South London, actually one of the more effective specialized agencies within the UN system. I think the United Nations will be an important organization in the development of the governance of the high seas. And it will need to cope with, and the IMO will be very important in this sense, it will need to cope with a lot of these problems uh, at sea. But it is difficult to try and predict what will happen in the future. When I talk about this sort of thing, I'm always reminded of that wonderful scene in Blackadder. Uh, Blackadder's sitting there in his chamber and he's doing whatever Blackadder normally does. And all of a sudden, in through the door, rushes Baldrick. And he says, Sire! Sire! I've got some really bad news. And Blackadder turns around and says, Yes, Baldrick, what is it? And he says, The Hundred Year War's just started, Sire. <laughs> You know, I, I, I do sometimes think that people actually expect those of us working in the academic world to do a Baldrick. And, and sadly, I'm not anything like as intelligent as Baldrick clearly, clearly is. It's, it's a problem trying to predict what will happen, but it is my sense at the moment, even though many people who I call colleagues in navies and in shipping industries and all the rest of it would say I'm talking rubbish... And I, this is why I'm looking over a, a span of time. I do think that we are going to have to really seriously address the issue of exclusive flag state jurisdiction. We cannot have ships plying the ocean full of drugs that have the legal right to do precisely that. Now, there's lots of regulation there, and you can point to conventions that say that they, in theory, can't do this. But actually, that isn't true. If their flag state has not signed the convention, it's not binding on them. It's not like domestic law. A convention is not like an act of parliament. It's like a contract between those states that have signed up to it. So if you happen to have your vessel flagged in the Marshall Islands or Sierra Leone or Zanzibar, you may have it flagged there because it's very convenient because you know that they're not a party to whichever convention it is, the Vienna Convention for the Suppression of the Illicit Trade in Narcotic Substances, for example. It may be that that's, you, you're doing that deliberately. And in theory, at least, you, a, 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 a warship, even if it knew that a vessel was loaded to the gunnels with drugs, there would be a very serious question about whether it would be lawful for the warship to board it. So I think my prediction, if that is what it has to be, is that there will be a move afoot eventually to move against exclusive flag state jurisdiction, which is a norm that owes its existence to the traditional high seas freedoms. I'm going to stop there, although I've got one small postscript. Um, Peter Naylor's memorial lecture is a defense lecture. And uh, as, a, as a naval person, I suppose I ought to make a, a naval point. Um, it seems to me that in this, in this ocean sense generally, we have to rely on the major powers with the capacity to act in a practical sense as much as a strategic political sense, we have to rely on the states that have got the physical wherewithal to conduct the sorts of operations that we need to have conducted in order to suppress the activities that are threatening the stability of the world. And we've seen that, have we not, with the naval forces that have gathered in the Indian Ocean under NATO and EU auspices and, uh, and also, of course, the naval forces of a wide range of other, uh, other states as well, including China and India. The major powers need to be able to... I mean, they have a responsibility, it seems to me, to work to ensure security and stability at sea. Britain, on any 
assessment that you care to make in this context is what I would describe as prima facie a great power. I get rather fed up, rather cheesed off, uh, listening to people in this country say that the United Kingdom is really a minor power these days. There are about 200 states in the international system these days. The top 5% of those states, the top 10, in other words, includes, in almost every category you care to name, includes the United Kingdom. We have, actually, admittedly, only the 13th largest merchant ship fleet at the moment, but in terms of ownership of merchant ships, we're sixth in the world, because, of course, a lot of the vessels that we own are flagged to convenience registries. We are a very important maritime power, and I think, therefore, we have a fairly important and marked responsibility to be one of the leading powers dealing with this problem at sea. When I was putting this last postscript together the other day, I thought I'm going to do a quick exercise. I happen to have at home a copy of Jane's Fighting Ships from 1971, which was the year that I joined the Royal Navy. Now, the workhorses of the fleet in the context of the sort of things I've been talking about are frigates and destroyers. They are the vessels that actually do the business. Forget the aircraft carriers, even though I wrote the doctrinal justification for the carriers during the SDR 13 years ago, or whenever it was. Aircraft carriers do what aircraft carriers do, but they don't do a great deal when it comes to maintaining general order at sea. The constabulary tasking is the work of frigates and destroyers. In 1971, operational frigates and destroyers run by the Royal Navy numbered just about 80. Operational frigates and destroyers run by the Royal Navy today, less than 20. Global trade, 1971, 2,500 million tonnes. Global trade, now, today, 8,500, approaching 9,000 million tonnes. You've got a graph with two curves going in directly opposite directions. It seems to me, and this is my sort of naval sort of bias speaking, I suppose, a sort of bid to try and influence the next strategic defence and security review. I'm not sure that I will have any impact on that at all. But it does seem to me to be very strange that a major maritime power like the United Kingdom is reducing its capacity to act at sea in the way that it is in the face of the massive increase in the usage of the sea and the vulnerability of activities that are going on at sea, including, importantly, maritime trade. I hope and I pray that there will not be a major event of cataclysmic consequences, a sort of 9-11 of the sea. I hope and pray that there will not be one of these things. But there might be. And I think we need to bear that in mind. Because if there is something like that, if container ports are seriously attacked and undermined, if global container shipping is seriously attacked, then globalization will be placed seriously under threat. Um, and I, I just hope that more and more people come to realize that that is the reality out there at sea. I've spent a good chunk of my life at sea. I know what it's like out there, I suppose, and I'm therefore biased. Um, but then if I wasn't, I wouldn't be here giving this lecture. Thank you very much indeed. Right, now, I've, I've got, I think, how long have I got? We've got until 7.15, so about 15 minutes for some questions. So, and I will, I will run the question session. You, sir, put your hand up first. There's a, there's a microphone just coming across, if you can speak into the microphone. A question of piracy and uh, illicit uh, trade of goods. Surely the only um, internationally 
possible, uh, only, only, uh, the only possible international body to be able to do that are insurance companies, in particular Lloyd's. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be possible for Lloyd's to make it incumbent upon these registering countries to ensure that their ships behave in such a fashion as we, we have insurance companies controlling what we do on the roads uh, and, and, uh, in, and we, uh, are, we incur heavy, pen, heavy penalties if we breach those, those conditions. And surely Lloyds could make a very strong position in controlling these situations by uh, uh, making these companies incur heavy penalties and in fact taking them out of the seas altogether no. if necessary. No, no, don't get me wrong. I mean, I've, I've, been, I've, I've had about 45 minutes to explain the subject that I've been explaining. There, in, amongst these many regulations that exist these days, there are, of course, regulations about standards of shipping, standards of registries, and all the rest of it. There are insurance processes that will check out the, um, the state of shipping companies and the states of registries and all the rest of it. That is certainly there. And you're right. Um, insurance companies do have a very big role to play. But insurance companies are not necessarily always going to be working to the good. I mean, during the early stages of the Somalian piracy problem, insurance companies were simply just paying them off. They weren't doing anything to stop it because it was actually in their commercial interest to pay them off and get the hostages back, get the ships back. That was a, I mean, they made a serious commercial decision to do precisely that, which in a sense almost made the problem worse. So, uh, yes, you're right. Insurance companies, Lloyd's, and shipping organizations that are responsible for registering ships, they all have a massive role to play. And, of course, the International Maritime Organization, Maritime Safety Committee, all of these bodies are there trying to make these mechanisms work in the right way. But it is still flawed. And it doesn't stop, for example, somebody using a Sierra... I mean, Sierra Leone registry may well be perfectly well managed in Freetown. That doesn't stop somebody using a vessel flagged in Sierra Leone to smuggle drugs in the Mediterranean. And an insurance company is not covering that ship for that. So those sorts of illicit activities will still go on. So yes, you're right. There's a lot of stuff out. There's a lot of regulation. Uh, there are a lot of conventions dealing with ship condi the, the standards of ship registration and so on. And these are all very, very important mechanisms. But they're not perfect. And they don't always, they don't always work. Why can't Lloyd's be much stronger? Why can't? <laughs> well, I mean, Lloyd, it, it's, a, it's a commercial business, isn't it? I mean, if you're, if you're an investor in Lloyd's, you want to turn your profit, and there's nothing wrong with that, but actually policing the oceans is not part of Lloyd's um, responsibility, and, and, and who's going to pay for that? It's a, you know, it's a very interesting idea, but I don't think Lloyd's is the, is the right organization to take that role. It's a commercial organization. It's interested in its own profit. Right. The lady there, please. I recently heard, I recently heard a senior naval officer say on the radio that, in fact, <coughs> ransoms for hostages nearly always are paid because otherwise the shipping industry couldn't recruit staff. I realize you partly answered this in your <laughs> last, uh, mm. to, to the last questioner. But would you like to comment further on that? Thank you. Sure. I think the, uh, I mean, my, my view, which is a very easy view for me to take because I'm not a hostage, um, <laughs> and I've always been on the, the sort of enforcement side of the process, my, my position on it is that one should never pay, hostages, pay money for hostages at all under any circumstances, because if you do, you encourage the taking of further hostages. It becomes a business. And actually... The Somalian piracy business, uh, I mean, it's a very good business plan. It's a very good business model ashore in Somalia, I can assure you, and there has been in the past. They've, they've, they've vectored all of these considerations into, into their business plan, and, they, and they've operated on that basis. I think it was wrong to do that, but I can't fault the commercial decision to do it, 
because the commercial decision is how do I get around this problem at least cost to my company? And if the least cost to my company is to pay a ransom, we pay a ransom. It's one of the reasons, incidentally, why we refer to this as piracy and not terrorism. There was a big debate a couple of years ago about whether these Somali pirates should be referred to as terrorists. Of course, if you refer to them as terrorists, it would be unlawful in this country, as well as many others, to negotiate with them. It's not unlawful to negotiate with pirates. So the insurance companies and the shipping companies, the last thing they wanted was to have Somali pirates <coughs> labelled as terrorists because that would have caused those negotiating for the release of hostages with those terrorists to be breaching British criminal law. I agree they shouldn't pay money, but as I said, I'm not a hostage, and I'm not faced with having, I've not been faced with having to make that decision. It must be one of the most difficult decisions that anyone would have to make in any circumstances. Shall we go right to the back so it gives somebody else a chance? And then if there's anybody on this side, we'll go for that side next, and then you as well afterwards. Um, you have uh, partly uh, answered it uh, a little while ago, but I refer to the last World War, of course, uh, where we had um, armed convoys that mm -hmm. went from A to B. Uh, to prevent attack from German, Nazi German U-boats. Um, you uh, presumably would recommend the building of more fast frigates, small frigates and destroyers, uh, to allow a, a convoy system to be um, uh, organized. Uh, what do you think of that? Uh, one more little thing, uh, and it was for the... Um, uh, migrants that uh, where the boats sink and they're designed to do that uh, to um, for each warship to carry uh, shall we say a bundle of inflatables uh, so that they can be dropped in the sea uh, the migrants put in them uh, the each unit chained up and possibly taken back to either their original land or a suitable point uh, to um, uh, discharge them off finished yeah, the, um, the issue of convoying. I, it's a very, very interesting question, this. I, I, yes, of course, I'm a naval officer, and I'm, I'm convinced, actually. I was involved a few years ago in some operational analysis, which proved that convoying would still be the best way to defend a, a, a large number of merchant ships. There's always a debate about this in naval circles, about whether convoying or free passaging is, is the more effective. Uh, the general feeling is that it changes as the technology changes, as detection, as submarine technology changes, and so on. Uh, but convoying is and has been for generations, from the Spanish, uh, Spanish treasure ships right the way through to the last, last war, where convoys were proved to be the most effective way of protecting merchant ships. Um, I have to say, however, that it's... A, it, again, looking at trends and looking at things that have happened, there's a lot of law dealing with economic warfare at sea, which is what we're talking about here. What the Germans were doing, and indeed what we were doing in the Second World War in attacking shipping, was we were trying to put economic pressure on the opposition, and they were trying to put economic pressure on us. And this was a legitimate means of conducting war. When um, Hans Langsdorff sailed the Graf Spee into the South Atlantic uh, and the southern part of the Indian Ocean in the what, what was our autumn of 1939, but which would have been the, the spring of 1939 in the Southern Hemisphere, he was doing nothing unlawful by boarding British merchant ships, removing their crews, and then sinking the ships in the middle of the high seas. What he was doing was actually, strictly speaking, perfectly lawful in the context of the law governing the conduct of economic warfare at sea. And those, those laws still exist in theory. It's my belief, though, that in the 60, 70 years since 1945, the global shipping industry has changed fundamentally, and the general political strategic environment has changed to such an extent that I think that these sorts of activities, I'm not going to say they're not going to happen again, but they're unlikely for a range of strategic reasons. Um, the 
convoying of vessels. You're right, frigates and destroyers, again, it's a, it's a frigate and destroyer type business. It was destroyers during the Second World War that spent a lot of time in the North Atlantic. And of course, knowing full well that there is an RAF officer of some renown sitting uh, in the front row here, I should point out that actually quite a lot of the ASW work that was done in the Battle of the Atlantic was actually done by Coastal Command by the RAF. And there are a great many submarines prosecuted by the, by the air forces rather than by naval forces. Um, but that's not something that I, I think is, is likely to happen again because it's about the great powers in the international system going to war with each other and applying very strong economic pressure on each other. So we're talking about China versus the United States. Um, that sort of war, which I'm not going to say it's not going to happen again, but I rather hope that it isn't, and I suspect that it won't in the near future. But that's about as far as I'm going to go predicting. The other question you raise about how you deal with um, people who are trying to move from one place to another using small and rather unsafe boats. Well, yeah, it's a nice idea, but it, it, th there's a whole pile of different things that might be done. Um, but simply taking these people back from whence they came is not always a legitimate thing to do, particularly if they are claiming asylum and they feel that they are, as refugees, under threat in the country from which they're escaping. Um, to return them there would be contrary to international law. So it's, it's, it's not as easy as simply taking them back from whence they came. Um, and that's why, I have to say, that it's, it's one of the more difficult problems that somebody might have to deal with at sea today. What do you do with two or three hundred refugees or asylum seekers or potential asylum seekers who are sitting in a rather rickety old boat halfway across the Mediterranean? Do you take them back to North Africa or do you take them north to somewhere in Italy or southern France? Good question. Um, and it's a very, very difficult one to provide a sensible answer to. Yes, please. Um, first of all, I agree totally with you about the reduction in our naval force. I, I think that was an absolutely ridiculous thing to have done. Um, because we need it, as you say, for a lot of the piracy, terrorism, people trafficking. Um, but as far as other crime that happen out in the middle of the sea, we have, a, as you say, there's a 21,000 container ship. If there were one out in the middle of the sea full of drugs, guns, and people, so what? Doesn't matter. It's not important. What is important is where it's going. And if you can't do anything while it's at sea, I'm pretty sure technologically there will be a way of tracking it to and what we need yeah. to do is stop it where it's going, but that will take a huge international response and agreement. Do you think that is something that would ever come about internationally? I, we've I think, reached that point. I, I think if you don't mind me saying so, I think it's a slightly un, 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 um, uh, unrealistic possibility. I mean, I'm not... A, a, a container ship carrying 18,000 containers is, is unlikely to be carrying is unlikely to be used for that reason. No, no, but, but, but let me come back to this, because actually it's, it is quite an interesting question, because I'm not saying that some of those containers themselves might not be used for that purpose, but there is absolutely no way that you can board and search a container ship at sea. Um, the, the boarding and searching rules and regulations and processes um, at, at, at an earlier stage in my career, I was um, a, a fairly experienced boarding officer, and I spent a lot of time boarding and searching merchant ships. There was no way that I could search a container ship, and the, th the simple reason for that was that when I got on board and I said, what have you got on board, the master hadn't a clue, because the, the, the contents of those containers was not known by the ship's own officers. At the same time, actually, one of the most fascinating ships that I ever boarded was an old clan line vessel from 1940s vintage. This was in the mid-1970s. It was on its last operational run from West Africa to Europe. It was the Clan McInnes, and it came into 
Belfast, which is where I was boarding these ships for various reasons. And I had a fantastic day wandering around the Clan McInnes, um, searching it or wandering around with the first officer, finding out what was in the hold. It was a general cargo vessel. It was the old traditional form of general cargo. It was an absolute joy and delight to go on board this ship and find out what it was doing and how it did it. That was the sort of ship that was boarded and searched by people from the Graf Spee in the autumn of 1939 at the opening stages of the Second World War. That was the type of vessel that was conducting international trade at sea. It's no longer the case. Those ships simply do not exist anymore. They're all, or most of them, are now container ships or tankers or something of that nature. And you can't search a container ship at sea. In fact, if I had to, con if I had to search a container ship or I wanted to search a container, I had to bring it alongside in Belfast or Warren Point and search it alongside. I had to get the container off the ship, put it onto the jetty, and then open it up and look at it there. You can't do that at sea. It's physically impossible. Well, that's what I was saying. We could track... It must, surely we can track the, um, the ships because everything they have on board is useless to them out at sea. They're looking for a port. They'll be going to a port, and it's once they get within those port... Um, you know, the 12 mine zone even, wherever they're going, track them and, yeah, and, I, and do and, it all and, there. And, and there, there are a lot of other things have changed over the years. It's now, of course, almost every ship on the planet, its precise position is known. Um, the, the, the way that ships are tracked these days is, is, is very much improved on what it was when I was a young officer at sea 30, 40 years ago. We know where all these ships are because we track them using GPS and so on. That's absolutely true. But it, it depends what it is you're trying to stop them doing. Um, and, and there's a wide range of things, be, ranging from very fast, small boats careering across the Caribbean with drugs on board, to large um, coastal merchant ships carrying people, and carrying, in the Nigerian case, of course, tankers carrying oil. Um, and to monitor all, how do you, you can track them, but you don't know what they're doing, and you don't know what they've got on board. Got, there's no way electronically of finding out what they've got on board. We had this actual problem, or this suggestion was made some years ago when I was involved in fisheries. I used to be a, a, a Royal Navy British Sea Fisheries Officer. I used to do fisheries boardings around the UK. And at that stage, it was theoretically possible for the technology to be there to, to track fishing boats. Well, these days, that is what we do. But, of course, in those days, as we're talking back in the 1980s, it was highly controversial because the fishermen didn't want to be tracked. Uh, they thought this was, you know, Big Brother watching them. And, of course, it was Big Brother watching them because we wanted to know where they were going. Um, they didn't like that idea. Uh, but it was theoretically possible to do that then. But what we couldn't do, and why I absolutely had to insist when I was talking to planners in the Ministry of Defence about this, is you cannot check fish holds using a satellite. You've actually got to physically go on board the thing, and you've got to measure the fish, and you've got to measure the nets, and you've got to do all that. The only thing that that tracking can do is tell you where a boat is. It can't tell you what it's doing, what it's got on board, who it's got on board, and what their motives are to, for doing whatever it is that they're doing. You need presence at sea to do that. And you don't really know very often where they're going. So the, the business of which port are they going to is, is, is a mystery. Are you... One last, question. one last question. I've got one last question. Shall I take another one from this side if there is one? The gentleman at the back. Um, was there not once a time when we would interfere with um, shipping on the high seas for reasons other than the suppression of piracy? For example, the slave trade. Yeah, the, the slave trade is another um, uh, reason, uh, traditionally, that we did interfere with shipping on the, on the high seas when we were suppressing the, the slave trade. And, of course, the slave trade is still with us, sadly. Um, there are still those who are taking people, people smuggling, but they're not being smuggled because they want to be. They're being smuggled because somebody else is smuggling them for, for devious reasons. So the slave trade, you're absolutely right, the slave trade is another one of these things. It's a, again, it's a question of just how much time I had to mention everything that, that, was, that, that, I, that I needed to mention. So that's still there. People smuggling is still a problem. 
Right. Look, I'm, I'm very happy to chat to people while having, I understand, a drink in, yes. a, in a very short space of time. <laughs> so um, please do ask me questions later. Thank you.